welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show for you today. The main theme of the show is traditional drawn thread work. Oh, do we have some beautiful techniques for you. Now, this is not traditional. This little boy suit is not traditional drawn thread work, but I thought I would show you that you can get a drawn thread look by just using some lace. Now this is not drawn thread, this is lace attached by machine, but you see it sort of maybe looks like drawn thread. Drawn thread, the traditional hand drawn thread, does not have to be white and heirloomy. This little dress is absolutely magnificent. Here is the drawn thread up here with the little circles woven in out of bright colors in this very happy little girl's dress, but yet it's still drawn thread. Now this is, of course, my very favorite. This is the traditional drawn thread day gown with the beautiful drawn thread hem stitching. This is hand hem stitching, which is attached this released pleat. And then the, th two, the three center pieces are the traditional drawn thread work with, again, the other side, the little uh, tuck has been attached with hand hem stitching. Now let me turn this over. This is absolutely beautiful. The placket has been attached with the hand hem stitching, which of course is drawn thread work. I have another magnificent baby day gown for you. This one has just beautiful, delicate work. And in the center here, there are some drawn thread rows with beautiful little hand embroidery. And I have to turn this around and show you the sleeve with the three tiny, tiny, tiny rows of hand drawn thread work. And now let's learn this wonderful technique. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today my dear friend and business colleague Claudia Newton. Claudia is editorial director of the Fancy Work section of So Beautiful magazine. She has also studied at the Japanese School of Embroidery. Claudia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's a real pleasure to be here. The technique that we're going to talk about today is drawn thread hem stitching. And the day gown shows some samples of the work that we'll be doing. There's a center section with two little side sections. They're a little smaller. And also there are tucks on the shoulders. They have also been tucked. Um, hem stitched with this drawn thread work that we'll be talking about. The first thing I want to talk to you about is a little bit of preparation work. So many times we learn how to do stitches on these things and we don't quite know how to get there. So the first thing we're going to start out with is how to set up your project. We're going to talk specifically about this day gown and the first thing I'm going to start with is the back of it. What you need to do is to take your pattern piece and you notice where the back facings are marked to be folded in. This is just a small sample, but I've marked where my facings will be folded. And to find out where to place the drawn thread line, I have to actually fold those facings in place because it's not drawn on the fold line, it's drawn inside the edge here so that you can see. This one has been turned in and basted. This is what your piece will look like and it will be a piece big enough to cut the back out of. This has been basted down where the facing goes. I've actually traced my line on here so that I'll know that I have enough when I'm finished to cut out my day gown back. To prepare the front, we're going to do a little bit differently. It's similar. This time I only need to trace the shoulder line and the neck onto my fabric because when I take up tucks, I'll change the shoulder line a little bit. These are being added. So what I've done is to trace this design on here, just the shoulder and the neck edge, and I've placed it over a pattern piece that's marked where I want the sections to go. This one actually has thread counts at the top because it was designed for the heavier linen that the day gown is made out of. This sample is shown on Batiste because I want you to see that with different thread counts, rather than marking four threads, I might mark a fourth of an inch to know that I've got the same spacing in there. And I have marked on here with light blue thread where it'll stitch. I'm not sure if you can see where the thread lines are running, but this is where one area of drawn thread starts. This is where another starts. And I've buttonholed across the bottom edges so that I know exactly where it's going to stop. And that's been done on a straight thread, a horizontal thread, so that I know it's on grain. The next thing that I've done is after I've buttonholed at the stop point, I've withdrawn the threads all the way up at the proper width. 
This allows for the tuck that I'm going to be folding into place later and you'll see how that's done. Now on a larger piece, this is much easier to see. This is exactly what I just showed you. This is the center of my garment. This is where the side sections of hem stitching go. And here you have the tuck. Right down the middle will be the tuck fold line. These two lines mark the areas where I would start pulling threads to do the drawn thread stitching. If you look on the back side of this, right behind the buttonhole stitch where the lines are drawn out, I've clipped the threads, the vertical threads only, at the bottom edge and completely withdrawn them from the top. You can see here there are two clipped threads and to remove those all you would do is to take them and pull them straight out the bottom. And I don't know if this will pull or not with it being there. So you can see that that was how you would remove them. Once they're all removed, you do your stitching, then replace that over the pattern piece and that is when you would cut out the pattern piece front. The thing that we're going to do all uses one stitch. So we're going to go through this fairly quickly. It's an easy little knotted hem stitch. I've started at the edge and since I had a hem, you can tie off inside or on the back edge of that hem. I'm going to bundle four threads at a time. So I've come out, I'm in the hem area here, make a full circle down to the left and up and come inside that circle under the threads to be bundled. I'm going to count over four and I come out with the needle in the circle on the other side of the bundled threads. Then all I do is pull it up and pull the knot down and I've got my stitch. But to anchor the hem in place, I need to go back and pick up about two threads of the hem, like so. Then I would make another circle down and to the left, pick up four more threads and pull the knot down. At this point, I would take my anchor stitch again and that's how I anchor the hem. The center section is done similarly to that what we do this time is to do a row of knot stitch just like we did the first time. Then we do it on the other side as well, catching the same bundles again. The difference here is that I'm simply going to take the knot stitch, let me get my circle here, and when I pick up the bundle this time, I pull it down to a knot, but I don't have to take a catch stitch there. And it makes a little chain right across this top edge. Now once I've done that, the second step to this is I'm going to take the bundles and bundle them again. I'm going to do the same stitch in the air by looping it. This time I pick up two bundles of threads, pull it through, and it, tug it down until it's the right distance apart, and I've made a knot. I loop it again, go under the circle, pick up the bundle, pull it through, and I make the last knot. So this is how the center section is done and you can see the row of buttonholing down here. The last thing I want to talk to you about is, actually there are two more. This one is done the same way with the knot at the bottom but the difference in this one is that we have two rows of these knots zigzagging back and forth. To do the top row of knots I come up and around to the left. Then I still come inside, it's not flipping right, inside the circle, under it there, pick up the four threads, I'll loop it around just in a minute so you can see, there, so that I still come out inside the circle and pull it up. So it's the same stitch, I've just done it to the top direction this time, so that it pulls that way. Then I come down to the bottom, pick up four more, and knot it. So that's the difference in that one is when you go up, you loop it up and to the left. When you go down, you loop it down and to the left. The last thing is the tucks and they are done just like the hem except that I've folded on that fold line. So now I have two sets of drawn threads, one on top of the other. They're lined up in there. So you've got a back layer and a front layer. I still take four, bund four, four threads to make a bundle. So I go under four and I'm catching the front layer and the back layer, pull it down to the knot and this time I do pick up a, t a catch stitch through both layers just like I did the hem and that makes the tuck nice and firm. I loop it one more time, take one more stitch and we're done. And the last thing I need to mention Martha is that some of this was done in a hoop and some of it was not. 
The reason for that is if I'm working on a tuck or a hem, I have double layers of fabric and it's very stable and I can work without a hoop. Mm -hmm. If I'm working on single layers, I need a hoop to keep from drawing the fabric too much. Oh, Claudia, thank you so much for that wonderful thank presentation. Thank you. And now we have a project sewing for your baby. On this beautiful little day gown, Claudia has a very interesting technique to share with you. The little bias binding around the neckline and around the sleeves and around the hem of the skirt, Claudia chose to make out of a Swiss batiste, although the day gown is made out of a linen. And I just think that is really a pretty and a very interesting thing to do, Claudia. As a matter of fact, putting a bias binding on the skirt is a very interesting thing to do. Such an elegant detail. Claudia, I'm going to turn this over to you now. Okay, thank you. The reason I did this is because with all of the hem stitching on the top, it has to be done on straight grain. And the bottom of my gown was curved. So rather than putting just a, a regular turned up hem in it, I wanted something a little bit decorative. So I decided to bind it just like I did the sleeves and the neck. Now you may have done bindings on sleeves and necks before and they're not a problem because we have short strips of binding. But when you get to a skirt, if you didn't have extra fabric to start with, you may find that you need to piece the bias. That's something that sometimes you've never had to do. So I thought we would explain a little bit about how that's done. The first thing you need to realize is how bias is cut. We normally work with the straight grain of the fabric, which is parallel to the selvage. You have the cross grain of the fabric, which is at a 90 degree angle to the selvage. A bias is cut at a 45 degree angle. So the red line here indicates where the bias grain of my fabric runs. And this shows you how a bias strip is cut out of that. It looks kind of strange because it's got a slant on one end and then the angled sides, but when we work with it, it is actually a straight piece like that. So you need to understand how it's cut out of the fabric. Once you've cut those bias strips, if you don't have a long piece, you will have to piece it. This is already pinned together to be shown and it looks a little strange to you, so let me show you how that happened. These are the two bias strips that I started with and if you'll line them up, right sides up, with the lines matched up at the edge where they have been cut, you simply fold one down over the other until those edges meet. And see where the little offset is there? It looks wrong, but it's not. It has to be offset that way for it to match up after it's stitched. You want this offset to be the same width as the seam allowance. So if I'm gonna stitch with a quarter inch seam, I have a quarter of an inch hanging out right there on the edge. There'll also be a quarter inch hanging out on the top edge. Once you've stitched it, you'll stitch right straight parallel to the cut edges. That gives you a seam that looks like this. It's diagonal, you'll press it open. Before you use it, you'll want to go in and clip off the little extra edges like this. Then you have a normal looking piece of bias, but it has that diagonal seam in it. That helps because it's on the grain, so it won't stretch. It's on the straight grain, by the way. And then when you fold it in half, you'll notice that the two seam allowances now are offset. I've got offset seam allowances, so it reduces the bulk. The next thing now that I want to show you is that when you stitch that onto a curve, you don't have to curve the bias. I was always taught that if you stitch bias around a curve, you have to stretch the bias first. Press it with an iron, stretch it, curve it, and everything like that. You don't need to do that. If you'll stretch it slightly as you stitch. And by the way, this is a French bias. It's cut six times the finished width. So if I have a fourth of an inch, I cut it six times that wide to start with. Once I have folded in half, then a third of that, which will be a quarter of an inch, is my seam allowance. And I stitch it. And if you see here, I'm curving it just gently as I go around on the outside edge here, but not on the inside. Once it's stitched down, it's like any other bias that you would have put in there. We're not going to trim the seam allowance because I want it to stuff it and be the same size. So I flip my bias to the front here, roll it to the back on the back side so that it meets the seam allowance in the back. 
and then I would whip this folded edge to the stitching line right in the back and that's how you would finish that bias binding. Claudia, thank you so much for that lovely and elegant curved bias thank binding. You. And now I want to tell you there are a lot of wonderful notions on the market today. Recently at a sewing market in Dallas, Texas or in Arlington, Texas, this next segment was filmed for you. The problem with basting uh, a, a product where you want to make a stitch into a garment or a quilt and then you want to be able to stitch with, with traditional threads up to it to actually define the design and then pull your basted thread out so it leaves no trace has been a problem for years. Wash away thread solves that because you stitch it in with, in the needle or the bobbin just like a traditional thread but the minute it's exposed to water it totally disappears leaving no trace, no residue. Um, it's commonly used for trapunta and quilting where you want a puffy surface, you, uh, you stipple quilt right up to the edge of your design, you, uh, you then make your quilt sandwich, you quilt your fabric by, by quilting right up to the edge of where you've used the wash away thread, you expose the uh, quilt to, to water by spraying it or washing it, the, the wash away thread totally disappears leaving a nice trapuntoed piece for your quilt. Very useful, very adaptable for many, many basting problems. This is such an easy technique. I wanted to share with you how to make this beautiful dress. Really, this is a very plain dress. The only embellishment is grosgrain ribbon and little grosgrain ribbon loops on the dress. I first saw this technique on an antique petticoat that I bought up in Massachusetts. Here is the really pretty part right here with the grosgrain ribbon and these little loops. Now this is so easy to make. Let me just show you how. First of all, you hem your skirt, just put in a machine stitch. Then I'm going to make little grosgrain loops and pin them on the line that I have just stitched. The next step is to put a grosgrain ribbon on top of those little loops and then you can surely see that we're just going to stitch the bottom of that wide grosgrain ribbon and the top of that wide grosgrain ribbon as I have done here. Stitch and stitch and then I have my little loops all around it and this makes a very tailored look and as I said I first saw this on an antique petticoat. And next we have some silk ribbon stitches just for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today my friend Beverly Sheldrick from New Zealand. Beverly is the author of the book Colonial Inspirations and she is a frequent contributor to So Beautiful magazine. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you Martha, it's always wonderful to be here. Now Martha, today I thought that we would add a touch of whimsy to these the, uh, this baby blanket of ours and so we've got a little trail of snails marching down the hill here and then further on down here we have three little mice and another one just chasing the others around the corner. So they're really very easy to do. Perhaps the mouse is the easiest. So we're going to start with the snail. Now very very simple just a straight stitch here in the stronger colour give it a little head then here you will see how I've started in this section I've then just wound the the ribbon round every so often you have to twist it um, otherwise you just end it's caught down and here you will see that I've then taken a slightly stronger color just to give it a little bit more emphasis and finally we have two little antenna at the end here so just very quickly we'll go through those steps. We've got the body there. We're then going to put the head. You will see here that I have the ribbon. I've already started to do it. So I'm taking it through like that and just putting that, holding it down and then just couching it down with this second um, embroidery thread which is just going to hold it and I'm just going to keep on going round there like that, just getting it like that. Then I've finally taken the green here which is just 
again it will just be a few random stitches just like that to give it a little bit more interest. And finally we're going to do a couple of pistol stitches just at the end here to give it that little the antenna at the end there. And really they're very simple but it's surprising just how very effective they can be. So there we are just like that. And there they are zooming along. Now we're going to now look at the mouse and you can see I've used a seven millimeter ribbon here. Come up, you'll find when you come up, you just take your needle and just open out that end like that. You will also see that I've put the needle in there and I'm going to show you that in a moment. Then the ear using a lighter color, then the eye and the little nose and finally we've put a wee tail on him. And of course we must have a nice curl there. Now, so here we are. You, I want you to notice that I've put the needle at this top section here. And that means that when I take this through like this, that I will get a point there. And then I've got this section, which I'm going to then put in my ear. And we want, I want a nice perky little ear like that. Then we are come to the next section here. Just going to separate these. And we're going to two, three wraps, put in the eye like that. And then over to here. And you may have to just pull this back just a fraction. And we're going to do four wraps here because we want to have a perky little nose sitting on the end there like that. And finally, we're going to take our last needle here and we're just going to do a little outline stitch like that, forming the tail. And I don't really know why, but I do seem to like to put the curve section in first. Get that cheeky little part done. Just making sure that's underneath like that. And then coming on in to here. Just like that. And we're almost got a mouse. Beverly, that is such an adorable, a snail and a mouse. Now, I, I think that's a wonderful thing to have on an heirloom sewing show. Beverly, thank you so much. And now won't you come along to my attic with me? This is a wonderful blouse. It has hem stitching, and since this has been the main theme of our show today, I thought I would show you the beautiful hem stitching that comes around the collar, and then the rows, the two rows of hem stitching on either side of the center of the blouse. And then more beautiful hem stitching around this little crocheted motif. And then another beautiful uh, rectangular piece of hem stitching. You can also notice the hand embroidery that's inside these little sections, even the little hand embroidered dots. Now the hem stitching is not limited to the front section. <clears throat> There is also hem stitching on this beautiful fold back cuff with a little bit of tatting and then the hem and a very, very pretty hem stitching. And look at the wonderful details around on the side of the cuffs. One, two, three, four, five beautiful little satin stitch circles with more hem stitching up and down the sides. This blouse is a perfectly wonderful blouse and it really reminds me of the blouses that my grandmother might have worn when she taught school in Alabama starting in 1913. I thank you so much for coming to join me in my sewing room today. I've had a wonderful time and I hope you have too. Won't you join me next time? <laughs>